Well, good morning morning to you all. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We're going to begin our study there this morning. And we'll be in many different places in our Bible this morning. But we'll start in Genesis chapter 2. And while you're turning there, which shouldn't take long, because everybody knows where Genesis is. And it's the second chapter, so it won't take long to get there. Just let me say thank you so much for being here. We have just an absolutely packed auditorium. And it is such an encouragement and a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, the Bible says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper, suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Once God created man, he knew, he saw that it was not good for man to be alone. He knew that man was not complete in and of himself. And so as we read there in verse 18, God then sought a suitable helper to be the companion for the man. And so from the body of Adam, he takes a rib and from that rib, he fashions a woman and he makes her. God makes man and God makes woman. And then God does something else. He makes something else. He takes that woman that he had created. He brings her to the man and by doing so, he, he creates a family. God knew that it was not good for man to be alone. And so God created a family. The family that God created was intended to be the basic building block of all societies. It was to be the fundamental unit of civilization. And it was supposed to work in a certain way. God had a certain idea in mind when he made the family. Understand that, that, that creating a family and making a family is not and, and, and was not as simple as just bringing some people together to live under the same roof in the same house. But in God's conception, in God's design for the family, it is that he would bring certain people together. And those certain people that he brought together would have certain roles that they fulfilled and would have certain responsibilities that they were supposed to carry out. God's family looks a certain way. And so briefly, let me, let me describe that to you. In God's family, we learn that the man is the head of the house. He is to be the authority in his home. We learn that much in Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 23. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. And so in the home, as God designed it, the man is the leader. He is the provider. He is the protector. That's what it looks like in God's family. And in God's design, in God's family, the woman is to be joined to the man. That's the pairing that God ordained from the beginning of time. Genesis 2 verse 24, as we just read, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's God's design. One man, one woman for life. And notice that God ordains this pairing because, because they are good for one another. Because the man needs what the woman can provide. She is a helper that is suitable for him. If you have the King James Version, you know that it says she is a help meet. She helps meet his needs. She is not a duplicate of Adam. She is not a copy of him. She is not a man for a very good reason. Because Adam doesn't need a man. He needs a woman. She is a suitable helper for him. And that's what things look like in God's family. And in God's design, that man and that woman are given the power, 
the amazing power to create children. And once those children have been created, they're given the responsibility to shape, to instruct, to correct, and to discipline those children. The family is a place where a child is raised, where he or she learns how to conduct themselves in the world, how to live here in a way that is suitable and proper. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That's the way it works in God's family. That, of course, as we said, is a very extremely abbreviated discussion of the family. And there is much more to be said. But what I want you to appreciate this morning is that when you think about family, when you think about your family, I want you to appreciate that, that this is something that God built. This is something that God designed. God started something when he made the family. Today, everyone in this room is part of a family. And today, many people in this room are building families. God started something back in Genesis chapter 2 that now you have the privilege of taking part in, of being a part of. God started something and you're finishing what he started. Of course, maybe that's the question that we need to answer today. That all of us are part of a family and many of us are building families, but are you actually finishing what God started. That's our theme for the year. We're talking about finishing what, was God, what God has started. And I believe it was last week. I didn't write it in my notes. I should have written it in my notes because I can't remember anything off the top of my head when I'm up here. I think it was last week. Don talked about how God made the world and how we should respond to that. God started something when he created the world and when he created mankind. And also God made the family. And we are told to finish what God has started. But is that actually what we are doing as we raise and as we build our families? Are we finishing what God started? I ask that question because there is a real temptation to redesign the family. To build families different than what God designed. To build families different than what God initially intended. You know, with anybody who's engaged in any kind of construction project, you know that sometimes, sometimes when you take something that's your baby, that's your idea, that's your design, and you hand it off to somebody and you ask them to finish it, does it always come out exactly the way you envisioned? Sometimes it gets changed up, doesn't it? Sometimes people end up doing something different than what you imagined. So when I was a little boy, we were living in Orlando, and we lived in this awesome house that had fruit trees in the backyard. We had a grapevine, we had a tangerine tree, we had an orange tree, which was really cool. And so one day, mom gave us the worst tour that she, she could possibly give us. She said, I want you to go out and all the tangerines that have fallen down off the tree, they got overripe, they smell disgusting, they're totally awful. I want you to go out, I want you to go pick those up and put them into trash bags. It's the worst. I mean, give me any other chore other than that one. So we go out there and we start doing that. And then for some reason, we get into our minds that, that there's another job that we need to do. So we stopped getting all the tangerines up because they smelled really bad. We didn't want to touch them. They were gross and mushy. And we thought, well, look, that orange tree, maybe she would like it if we picked the oranges off of it. And so we left the tangerines behind. We went over to the orange tree and we spent all afternoon long picking those oranges off of the orange tree. The only problem was they were all green. So we took all the oranges off before any of them were ripe. And then we brought them in big paper bags to mom. And she was, she was really mad. <clears throat> Sometimes that happens. Somebody gives us a job. And when we hand that job off to somebody else, they, they don't quite do what we told them to do. Maybe that happens with the family too. That in Genesis 2, God starts something. He designs something. He invents something. Then he hands it off to us and says, build your family. Maybe we start tinkering with that a little bit. You know, I know that that's what happens. I know that's a temptation because, because what you see is that very soon, very soon in the book of Genesis, that's what people do. They start tinkering with God's design for the family. We see that with, with Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 6, after Adam and Eve commit their great sin... 
Uh, part of the consequence that's given to Eve is listed in Genesis 3 and verse 16. It says to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your ch pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now that's a little bit confusing, and commentators are divided about that, but many commentators believe that line, yet your desire will be for your husband, speaks to the fact that she as a woman is going to desire to take God's hierarchy in the family and to turn it on its head. She is going to want to take authority over her husband rather than letting him rule over her. And so from the beginning of them being kicked out of the garden, they're told that there's going to be this temptation. You're going to be tempted to take God's family structure and mess with it. And if we continue in the book of Genesis, it's not long before we really see people start to mess with it. We see that in Genesis 4 and verse 19, where we read about a man named Lamech. It says, now to Enoch there was born Irad, and Irad became the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael became the father of Methushael, and Methushael became the father of Lamech. Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. And so for the very first time that we can read about in the Bible, there comes along a man named Lamech, and he says, hey, everybody's got one wife, why can't I have two? So he starts tinkering with God's design. And it's not long before we get to Genesis 19, we read about Sodom and Gomorrah, which is a city, cities full of people who have taken God's design for family, God's design for sexual morals, and it's completely twisted those and perverted those. And it's not long before you find families like Jacob's. Jacob's family, great patriarch. Everybody looks up to Jacob, but, but he's got a family structure, a family dynamic. That's an absolute mess. Jacob's family is a disaster. You have 12 sons born of four different women, two sisters who are married to the same man, and two maids who aren't really wives but are still used to bear children, and they're all living together in the same house as one family. It's a mess. And so they're taking God's design for the family, what God originally intended, and they're, they're messing with it. They're changing it. They're adjusting it. They're tinkering with it. And I'd be remiss to say, I'd be remiss if I neglected to say, that today that temptation to tinker with the family is alive and well in us. There are some extreme examples of that in our culture. Polygamy is still practiced among many major religions. Of course, you have families that have same-sex parents, right? Two million children, two million children in the United States of America have parents that are not a husband and a wife, but they are uh, two parents of the same sex. And that is a adjustment of God's design. You have families that have been ravaged by divorce, ripped and torn apart, which under one extreme circumstance, God does permit. But most of the divorces that happen do not have to do with that. They're simply people who made families together, but for selfish reasons decided to rip them apart. There are other examples that seem maybe less extreme than that. Other examples of how we try to tinker with God's design, how we try to change the family structure, make it different than what God intended. And maybe, maybe we look at those things like polygamy and same-sex marriage and we say, we'd never be tempted to mess with God's design for the family. But maybe we are a little bit. Maybe when it comes to the idea of a man being the authority in the house. Maybe we're tempted to mess with that design. Maybe in our time, in our culture, we're more tempted to look at it and say, well, it should be 50-50. Everybody gets an equal say. That idea of a man being the head of a house is archaic and, and toxic. Are we tempted to think that way? Or maybe we look at the idea of a mother raising and caring and nurturing her family, and we say that's out of fashion too. In Titus chapter 2, we learn that women are supposed to learn to love their husbands, to love their wives, to be workers at home. But maybe we think that's out of fashion. Maybe we think that, that women need to put their careers before their families in our day and our time. Maybe we want to tinker with the design that way a little bit too. And this involves a much deeper discussion for somebody much older and more experienced than me. But don't we tinker with parenting too? We try to change the way parents react to their children. We become more permissive. We become different kinds of parents who don't raise and instruct and discipline their children like the Bible talks about. And so maybe we look at those extreme examples and say, I would never try to change God's design for marriage or family. 
But is that really true? I think all of us in some way, in some fashion, are tempted to tinker with God's design for the family. And so let me ask you, as you consider your family, as you consider what you are building, are you finishing what God started? Or have you taken his idea and begun to build something else entirely? Now, I do think it's worth asking the question, at the end of the day, why should we finish what God started? Why should I build my family the way that God designed it? Why can't I go off and just do whatever I want to do? You know, it's, 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 it's thousands of years later. Things are much different now. The world is different now. Technology and advancement and progress and all that junk. Things are different now. Why can't we build modern families the way we want to build modern families? Why design it the way that God said? And the first answer to that is because God said. He is the authority. He's the creator. He's the one who told us the way it should be. And so that's the way we should do it. And I guess technically we could leave it at that. But it's still a little bit early for lunch. So let's talk about that on a deeper level. I think there are some other things that we can say. Some other th important things we ought to realize about why we build families the way that God designed them. Two important things that I want to say about that this morning and then the lesson will be yours. The first one is this. I want you to understand that we build families the way that God designed because God knows his people. 